PowerPoint. Now it's full screen. Awesome, good. All right, so there is a reason that there is this little hot check here and saber-like swords thrown to this lecture. One of the controversial things I'm going to go at and hopefully convince you is true is that if we insist on taking a specific model as our Ursaber, what we wind up with is a hugely distorted history of how Europe handled its weapons. And we're starting before Napoleon because by the Napoleonic era, the Sabre had basically completely diffused through Europe in terms of mainstream constant usage. That's not to say that the Napoleonic era marks the actual divide between the early history of Sabres and the rest of the history of Sabres, which is also another commonplace I've heard on a number of occasions as I travel around and teach people about Sabres. The saber has existed in its functionally mature form for roughly a thousand years. And yes, I mean that exactly the way I said it. And you may not take that at full value, but by the end of the lecture, I think you will agree that it's at least a defensible thesis and that there's a lot more to saber going on than folks usually consider. When we get into the early history of the saber, though, we have problems. A lot of problems. My favorite being weapons being rehilted without conveniently notifying us future people. We will see that very directly once I start memeing my own lecture. We have archaeological finds that come in from various places where we're not sure where they came from, or where people are basically told, hey, we have an ideological concept, and you're going to subordinate your archaeology to our historical concept. This is especially the case during the very beginning of medieval studies as an actual intellectual discipline, where much of what was being looked at was being looked at as ways of justifying various forms of empire or ethno-national state building. And if you look on the left, you can see a whole bunch of different theories there, none of which you need to particularly know, except insofar as various governments told archaeologists, write according to these theories or stop being an archaeologist. When they were nobles who had lots of spare time, they couldn't quite do it that way, but those folks were typically invested in their community far enough that they natively used those ideas anyway. One of the big ones we have to deal with that's worth taking some time out here is oh, I gotta go backwards. Is Turanism and anti-Turanism because we have a very, very generic understanding of what the great step and Mongols and Kipchaks and Kuman and Ogus and what all those things are and how sabers relate to them. And a lot of romantic ideas either about the importance and interesting parts of the step or a lot of romantic ideas about how the step was garbage and created nothing continue to mar the archaeology of the subject to this day. Uh, Russ, sorry if I can interrupt you just very briefly. You have a discord.com is sharing your screen pop-up at the bottom of your screen. I'll that happily. Yeah, hide it please. Thank you very much. Sorry. You got it. All right, some of the things on the legitimately called this if we squint hard enough are ridiculous and thrown in there to be ridiculous. Others are not. You'll get to decide later. So what's a saber? If you have ever been in the Discord saber channel, your reaction to seeing this definition I've attempted to provide might be a smirk because we have spent a glorious amount of time shitposting at each other about what sabers are and are not. We have sabers that are long. We have sabers that are short. Does one make a saber or one make a coltellatio or cutlass? Are infantry sabers longer than cavalry sabers? Are they still both sabers? Does it have to have a hand guard to be a saber? What about a shashka? If you look at the history of sabers, you will see that there is a tremendous amount of things we legitimately call sabers, and they differ hugely in their constructions. And this problem has been around for a very, very long time. And people have attempted to create various forms of typologies to understand how they would address these things. 
And I'm no different. I use some of those same basic concepts here. For example, fourth saber from the bottom. I don't know if you can see my, my cursor or not. Can you? Yes, we can see your cursor. Your cursor Excellent. So I'm highlighting, I am currently highlighting what I would call a polish. It keeps jumping my saber around because it's evil. So this I would call a polish. I would call that a saber. I would call that a saber. I would call that a saber. That's a sword. That's a sword. That is a sword. That's a saber in my head. Why? Because we generally call sword saber-hilted swords polashes in East Central Europe. If you're a Byzantine and you have a sword furniture and you throw it on a saber, you call that a paramirian. It's a very different sort of game, and each region has their own way of playing with this. So much like David Edge, when he gave me a tour through his happy collection in London said that the Wallace collection was the finest collection of swords and unrelated hilts and hilt furniture in all of London. We see a tremendous variety of swords that have been rehilted later, or where someone says, I like this hilt, I can put it on that furniture. These folks were not bound to our future typologies. So while I was trying to brainstorm this, working with TV show in the late 90s, I was struck with, okay, if we're going to talk about sabers, how the hell do we define the sabers, and how can we come up with something that will actually make it make sense? So if you look to your right, you'll see I was an extra, and gentleman, not a fencer actually, he was a Southern Colory Pyatt guy because he had traveled extensively, nice guy, is posing with my head getting cleaved with a Tatar saber replica. Quite a faithful one. And in the bottom picture, you see it's my face getting cleaved, or almost cleaved, with the Turkish kilic. So in the one picture, saber is resting on my forehead. In the other saber, if you squinted closely and had better quality photos, you would have seen trees visible between his blade and my forehead. The important part of this for making a distinction of how is a saber curved and what effects do that have on trying to understand them in their own context, which is a different thing than I will be lecturing on today. And eventually you'll hopefully realize a much deeper and richer thing than what I'm talking about today, is he hasn't moved. He stood there and a third person actually took the Tatar saber out of his hand, put the kilich in his hand. Unfortunately, the gal taking the picture didn't quite have the same angle she shifted slightly from one foot to the other, and that was enough to throw the background foliage. But if you look at the horizon line, you'll see it looks very similar for a good reason. So the difference between the two of those is top cut, I am dead. No ifs, no ands, no buts about it. Unless he somehow pulls it or has somehow been having bad edge alignment, he is going to cleave my happy skull like a heavy metal album cover. Number two, if I flinch, if something happens, I might just get away with it with a cool looking scar. So about the year we lost Oakshot in 2002, I published an article talking about the functional geometry of sabers as held in the wielder's hand. Because for the art historian, these are just objects. For the person who wants to fence or understand how people fought with them, these are tools. And if you went to any carpenter and pointed at two hammers that had different shapes and said, eh, they're hammers, those shapes don't matter, you would get laughed out of the carpentry discord. Or they would take you kindly in hand and go, oh, look, newbie to carpentry. This hammer and this hammer are different. And God help you if you did that with Smiths. And there's a reason that a ball-peen hammer is a ball-peen hammer, right? Anybody here a smith who's actually peened down rivets or nails? Okay, well then, just trust me, it matters. Tools are invented the way they are for a reason. So when we hold the weapon, is the blade behind your hand? Does it curve back, in other words, towards your forearm? Is it aligned straight with the hand? Or does it come in front of the hand? If it's aligned straight with your hand and you rotate your hand or turn your wrist, nothing changes in the overall geometry. 
It's like holding a pen or a rapier, and if you just turn your hand into one position or another, the blade will travel through space a little bit. But otherwise, nothing much happens. There's still a line pointing from your hand towards the ceiling, the opponent, whatever. If you do that with a blade that's in front of the hand and has a curve, you have changed the engagement space. If you do that with a blade behind the hand, you have changed the engagement space. Depending on the way the blade cuts, depending on the way the blade is curved, the engagement space can change dramatically. There are techniques which work beautifully for blades which have canted handles where the blade comes in front of the hand that don't work at all with blades that go behind the hand and vice versa. There's a technique from the 19th century that I have apocryphally, I don't have it documented unfortunately, where you rush together in a crowd of people and you basically throw the weapon backwards behind your hip and you get a piece of him while keeping your hand up high so you don't get shoved down in the middle of a crowd. It works really, really well with a blade that has a big hooking curve, like a Shamshir or a 1796 light. That technique works a charm. It's almost unfair how well it works. If I try to make that technique work with a typical, slightly aligned to the front of the hand, Hungarian military saber, it no worky. In the process, we also have different kinds of curves, and those matter. A 1796 has a somewhat homogeneous, but somewhat hooking curve. Shamshir, on the other hand, have seriously dramatic curves, and this is not a Shamshir up here. One of the ways you can tell it's not is, if you look at this curve as I move the cursor through space, this is a homogeneous curve. A Shamshir comes down straight for almost half its length, and then dramatically curves the same distance that a 1796 does, or that one of these Circassian type blades does. So where the saber curves makes a huge difference. If you try to mouline with something that has a uniform curve, it will twist and rotate in your hand differently than if you try to mouline with something that mostly has a straight edge and then begins to hook notably. The former will want to make a helical motion as you turn the hand. The latter are happier making circles or straight cuts and then sort of flip dramatically as that mass affects the angle. Unfortunately, most of our saber topologies don't address these features at all. So Blotsky's manual here is an absolute glorious description of many, many, many sabers, but at the end of the day, lacking a functional topology for how to describe them, he sort of threw his hands up and said, um, we're going to go with hilts, and we're going to go with the Polish history we know because that's who my audience is, and I want it to make sense. Now, this is not to throw shade on Zabłocki. Zabłocki knows more about these artifacts and has forgotten more about these artifacts than I'll ever know. He just wasn't particularly a medievalist or had a different functional view on how these things came out. So the point is that we need these functional descriptions if we can get on the same page when we talk about how the saber actually moves around through Europe and what the history is. The rehilting problem, as you will see, is real. It's not trivial, and it's not solely what we would call late period modern stuff. The vocabulary issue is real. Coltellaccio, or big knife, means the same thing as longest messer, which also, if you happen to speak Edegaean, means the same thing as Shashka. They're all the same word. Sabya, or the Hungarian word for saber, means the same thing as Tasak, which becomes corrupted into Dusak or Dusaga in German. Cleaver, chopper, lopper, slasher. Things that whack onions into two pieces. So take a look in the lower right hand corner and get a sense of what your weapon you want to think of is. We're going to go to the next page and take a look at the functional descriptions of some historical sabers and see which one seems closer to your weapon of choice. If your eyes have started to dribble out your ears at these descriptions and lists, welcome to my world and welcome to that beautiful, beautiful meme about how you should look when you want to give 
a basic summary of the saber. For example, what's the difference between a turkeyle and a saber? What's the functional difference between a shamshir and a 1796 light? Does the slab hilt make it a different weapon? Now, I have a theory on that, which will become apparent as we go on. But sort of put that in your head and check it against what you know. I'm going to give you a second to take a look over this, since there's a lot of reading on this slide. It's a convenient place for any immediate interruptions, or, hey, what the hell is wrong with you, or any questions you've got. So, so far, if you're with me, what questions might you have? This is a lot to take in. Is there any, has there been any sort of attempt to reclassify sabers with more modern knowledge? I have done a teeny tiny bit and more, and more or less what I have found is there hasn't been much interest. The folks who've been interested in historical fencing and the functional part of saber use has been a teeny tiny community for a long time. And I know you say that the saber's time is coming, but the interest has been so low. I mean, that's why I'm the brand name in HEMA that I am today, right? There's just not been a lot of straight up this is the way it should be coming out. Interest in publishing something like that. I've thought about doing something like that several times. And now that Amazon actually lets you publish something cheap and easy or Lulu or one of the other services, I could do it if I thought there would actually be interest. So if you want to see it, I'll happily do it. But the archaeologists, for the most part, haven't bothered because in their world, what they really want to understand is what does this saber tell me or what does this weapon tell me about the people who were living there, the context in which they lived, the context of the people resulting in the finds and all those much deeper archaeological questions. It's not that those folks don't understand or can't be convinced to understand, hey, function matters. In fact, of all the different fields, they're the most likely to go, oh yes, function definitely matters. But our context doesn't particularly fit what most of the main audience for these finds really needs. Make sense? Yes. All right. I, any other questions or any objections? Yes, Daniel. Yeah, I can't see any patterns to this at all. Are there, are there any patterns? I mean, there's like one-handed, two-handed, cross-cut pommel, no cross-cut, complex hilt, straight blade, curved blade, etc., etc., etc. There's like no pattern to this at all. Is there any pattern? There is a sort of historical change over time, and there is not an immediate I can shove it into pattern. That's part of the problem. And part of that comes from we have people who call starkly different tools the same name. One of the reasons I started moving towards let's use a functional vocabulary rather than a typology is if you talk to a Prussian in the mid to late 19th century, he's going to look at a beautiful Swedish saber and say, nice palash, dude. The Frenchman with the straight blade is going to look at a saber and go, hey, this is all about the hilt. The Hungarian or the Pole is going to look at the straight blade and go, you can't call that a saber, dude. No, just, just stop. <laughs> Don't. And vice versa. And all around Europe, everyone's got their definitions which work in their cultural and military contexts. So unfortunately, I so wish I could give you a bang, this is a saber. Right now, we're left with curved swords. My personal topology is holding with, based on my scholarly work being based in East Central Europe, the historical terms which tended to be used there, which is saber equals curved blade. A saber-hilted sword can be characterized as a palash or palosh, and very few people would actually use a paramarian, but it was the term used for it for a long time. And making that distinction has tended to be the one that I default to because there's a long history of it and it lets us categorize these weapons cleanly. All right, somebody popped in. Who was that, please? That would be me. Hey, Sarah, what you got for me? And me. I have a question. Okay, that would be two of you. Sure. 
Yes. Um, so, what's the practical difference? You said something about handling, but what's what are other differences of an early curve and a late curve? Okay, so there is no early curve or late curve. It's a distinction that doesn't exist because later people frequently knew about earlier blades and would play fashion with them. For example, the Mamluk sword that's still popular today. When we, what we can say is that in general, earlier sabers tend to have no, 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 no. Sorry, curves. sorry. I meant uh, near the handle, so that the curve starts near the handle or near the tip. You said some uh -huh. of them have a straight blade and then they curve at the end. What's the difference of them? Like maybe difference in cutting, or you said handling, but what are the other differences? Okay, so if I'm going to take a parry with a blade that goes out straight and then curves, mm -hmm. I can extend my wrist straight forward and let the curve cross, cr come across my body. And it will pick up an opposing weapon differently than if the curve begins to arc across my body straight from the hand. So, for example, I'm going to go straight and curve just to give you the quick illustration. If I want to cover a point between my eyes, and I have a curved blade with a homogeneous curve, I can turn my wrist over into roughly the hand position for court. So a palm sort of up and to my left. And the curve of the weapon will create an arc through space that protects my entire left side. I may have to raise my hand up, I may have to bring my hand down, but that curve will protect me. If I do that with a straight stick or a straight sword, I am asking to die. Whatever blow comes in there will pick up the flat of my blade and smash through me like the Mongols went through Persia, and I will get cut. So I then have to, to make the same action, bring my point to the outside, and I wind up in a position similar to Ox or Fenestra. Or I have to take my arm much further out to the side in order to guarantee yeah. that I have the same strength of blade and alignment of blade to cover it. With me so far about the difference between curved and straight? So like that was the difference between curved and straight, but uh, what right. I meant is what um, it being curved near the handle or near the tip, what's the practical difference? Exactly. Okay, so if you're with me that far, the difference then is when I have a blade that is, for example, a hooking curve that comes straight out, I need a different distance in my hand to form my guard. And that different distance will mean that my alignments are different when an opponent fences with me. Now, if you're a rigor enthusiast like me, you look at a three or four inch difference between where someone's holding their hand in guard, and you say, that's a really big difference. If you're more of a grugger, you may not look at that difference and go, that really matters. To me, it matters significantly, especially with a hooking curve. If I'm having a stick come right out of my hand, I have no arc protecting me until the blade begins to curve, and it's curving at my weak. Okay, yeah. Which is not where I want to be picking up an opponent's blow unless I'm actually planning to make a yielding parry, right? So if they cut in and catch me on the straight part of my blade and I don't have that curve forming an arc, I once again have the problem that they're going to pick up my flat, which is not a problem if I plan to yield and a huge problem if I plan to static block. Make sense? Yeah, thanks a lot. Good answer. All right. Anybody else before we move into some timeline stuff and move past the these definitions matter, and unfortunately, they're a maddening, frustrating mess. Yeah, I got one. Okay, who's talking? Don. Uh, Don, yeah. Could you consider an Egyptian kapish a saber, or a saber-like sword? That is the 800-pound gorilla in the room, and I'm sorry to say that I consider the kapash an axe. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. I, consi I consider the kapash an axe made of bronze. All right, and I mean... Is it Mesa Oh, we'll get there. We'll get there. Bear with. Have you ever heard of a curved palash? Like, that's called a palash still? I am not familiar with a palash that is curved and called a palash. Now, 
Someone may have classified one and called it a palash, and I don't know about it. Very easily could happen. I have never seen it. Hmm. Somebody else popped in right before your palash question. Who was that? I don't. I want to make sure everybody has a chance to get questions in. I, I think that was me muting myself. Okay. All right. So, without further ado, and and moving on towards the Messer question, I'm not ignoring you, but I want to let you answer the question for yourself once you see the evidence. Let's talk about the diffusion of the saber in Europe. Now, this list is not exhaustive. There are other things we could talk about. For example, point eight, France discovers it loves hussars. About the same time, Prussia discovers it loves hussars. But we're not going to talk about Prussia at this point because they already had sabers and knew how to use them. And the big deal there was just lots of Hungarian emigres became available as manpower. So Prussia starts using a lot of hussars because, oh, look, we've got lots of people who have these skills who we can put alongside our heavy cavalry and our uhlans, and we're good to go. Whereas for France, the saber is really an outlier that's not native to French military organization up to this point. And we will refer to certain fencing resources along the way. So we're back to the Carolingian Renaissance, the 800s, the 900s. The, in Europe, as we call it today, the Bulgar Empire and the Avar Cognate both use sabers. Now, I referred to intellectual and historiographic problems with different theories, like the illyrio slyrian excuse me, Illyrio-Slavic continuity theory, the Hun-Hungarian continuity theory, the Daco-Roman continuity theory, all these, the 20th century was horrible, and the archaeologists will say what we tell them to or else. Lots of finds are a complete bloody mess. So there are places where we have difficulty distinguishing between an Avar saber and a Bulgar saber. The general consensus um, the historiography I'm familiar with in the 8th and 9th centuries is that the Avars tend to use a very small Turkic cross and they tend to be set up for a longer handle. And the Bulgar sabers can have a longer or shorter handle but tend to have keyens that are upturned and are very similar to early Hungarian sabers with little knobs. Climate changes. We get, well, all of early medieval history and all of high medieval history is marred by all these different tribes looking for places to be because there's this giant conveyor belt of I need places to put my animals and the crops are failing and we have to move, right? If you've studied any medieval European history, you know this is a huge affair. The Khazar Cognate gets crushed by loosely and very imprecisely called Vikings from the North. I know, I know, don't beat me up, we're just shorthanding that as we move through. The Hungarians move into the absolute wreckage of the Carpathian Basin, basically being chased there by Pechenegs who are in co cohesion with the Byzantines who like to play divide and conquer with Steppe peoples. Because they're rich and they have resources and it's much cheaper to bribe them into fighting each other than it is to actually do heavy patrols. At this point, the Byzantine Empire is really as its ally in Persia that it has been using to hold off the tyrannic peoples of the steppe has gone away. So for those of you who don't know the historiography, there was a point where the Byzantines and the Persians are su such allies against the steppe peoples that they actually have joint military settlements. It's a really big deal. Well, the Persians are having their own problems at this point. The Byzantines are fending off lots of people coming up from the south. So they would much rather have these guys fighting each other. The Avars are gone. They're crushed by Charlemagne and his dudes. There's no continuity there. The Great Moravian Empire is expanding. The Bulgar Empire is expanding. The Carolingians are expanding. And the Balkans are a no-go because the tribes living there are sick of everybody pushing into their territory, and that's why medieval Europeans have Plato but not Aristotle for actual centuries. So on my right we have a prototypical example of a Bulgar and or Hungarian conquest era saber. Just to give you an idea, oh look, it's a long blade, relatively light furniture, downturned key in with little balls on them, 
For a while, some archaeologists I spoke to said you can tell the Bulgar ones from the Hungarian ones because the Bulgars turn theirs down, excuse me, turn theirs up towards the hand and the Hungarians turn theirs down towards the blade. This is ridiculous. They straight up supposition, we have absolutely no idea. As a side note, we'll have various pieces coming in these slideshows and some of them that are older photographs I'm able to give you accession or inventory numbers for especially the ones from the armory in Croatia that I was able to pull out. I used to have much more data than this and lots and lots of pictures I could throw at people, but then I had water damage and lost something like 40 books. It was terrible, including some that are incredibly hard to replace nowadays. So the people who are making sabers are making sabers because they mean to. It is much harder to make a saber than it is to make a double-edged sword and that's because of the heat treat. Once you have that curve, it wants to tend to collapse into a forward-facing curve, the sort of curve that a yadagon has. If you're a smith, when you're making a saber by hand, you're fighting that in the heat treat all the way down the road. If I stuck modern furniture on one of these blades, assuming it was not hilariously oversized, because some of these are quite small, just like some modern sabers are, Assuming it was not hilariously oversized for the blades, you could be forgiven for not actually noticing that it was a 9th or a 10th century blade on these suckers. Unless, of course, it was archaeological condition. Sabers don't have pommels. Oops, except when they do. Sabers don't have slab constructions. They have tangs. Well, maybe. And we get into the distinction of what's its, what's its slab versus what's a tang. Different. In this case, you can actually see this right here, which the Chinese will call a tonko. So I have deformed eardrums. I can't make tones correctly. So you can look that up, T-U-N-K-O-U. It will probably be pronounced differently. You can't do it. Just a side effect of being a twin and sharing a room since before I was born. My ears got squished a little bit. This is a feature on sabers as they move east and by east, I mean really far east. And you'll often see them on Mongol blades and by blades that are picked up even further east than that. And of course, up top, we have the so-called saber of Charlemagne. Canted handle, mild curve, extended yeoman, clearly a saber. Are these sabers? The classic sources for these, note the tonko in the, in the middle picture, they, these are called paramirian. And the Byzantines distinguish them from sabers by their hilt type. Functionally, I think you would say, yep, that's pretty much a saber. In terms of the hilt furniture, you might say, hmm, the pommel on that cross changed it up. Whether this is a difference that made a distinction, or it was the difference between we're talking about different models of hatchback cars, we don't know because we can't interview them. By the 11th to 13th centuries, Byzantine gear was becoming sharply distinguished by its inclusion of what we will call steppa elements. And I'll get to that horrifying phrase in a moment. Not only were the Byzantines quick to adopt gear they thought were good, but they were coming into economic difficulties. And those economic difficulties extended into the Fourth Crusade, where the Byzantines had blinded a Venetian ambassador just basically to say, ha ha, look what we can do. We're big and powerful. You're an upstart little city. Go home, little man. They were shocked when that guy became the doge later and brought thousands and thousands of Western crusaders to sack the city. Unfortunately, the Byzantines had a long history of this looks good in the short term diplomatic solutions to problems. We care about that because it's about this period where the French start to create the falchion. And French falchions wind up looking a little bit different than sabers do. One of the reasons they look a little bit different is that the French have different horses. The French don't have a light cavalry tradition because to a great extent they didn't need it because they had lots of flat, arable land where they could have plenty of horses by European standards of the day. And their horses were cold bloods. They're just not as maneuverable. We already have Arabs and hot bloods from graves and cemeteries 
in the 12th to 13th centuries, and in some cases earlier among the Kuman and Pechenegs and Hungarians. So these people used ponies, but they also had hot blood horses where your more modern sense of, this is what cavalry does, I move fast, I turn quick, was completely available to them. If you've ever seen a reenactment between hussars, you can very easily tell who has the cold blood and who has the hot blood horse. Because the little zippy thing can turn six or seven times inside the space that the big cold blood can. Well, your tools look different when you go home and say, hey, there were these single-edged swords and they cut really well. You don't tend to emphasize the curve on it. So we talk about the step. But the elephant in the room is that until we get to the late Middle Ages, that is the mid 13th century, the reason, part of the, excuse me, part of the place we talk about as the European step doesn't exist. It's the Kievan Rus and it's full of cities. And those cities have people who have heavy gear, steppe type gear, and mixtures of the two according to their needs. For example, Chernigov, which was every bit as large a city as Kiev had, had a whole district of Hungarians in it. And their gear was very similar to Hungarian gear. You have an entire zone in Europe where what we consider Eastern stuff and what we consider Western stuff lives side by side. And that's for very, very good reason. You have circumstances where if you have to chase the Pechenegs, who historically equip out and gear out very, very light, you have to gear up light yourself or you're just not going to catch them. If you're going to fight the Byzantines or you're going to fight somebody up north who is in heavier mail or heavier equipment, you've got to get the heavier equipment yourself. Or you use your light cavalry to initiate holding attacks so that your heavy cavalry can come in and hit them while they're engaged with your light cavalry. This was taken for granted, for example, by the Cumans in conjunction with the Bulgars, smashed the Fourth Crusade at Adrianople in 1215. The reason the Fourth Crusade ends is that after the devastating losses of Adrianople, most of the Crusaders just go home. Literally, we have it in the Chronicles. They just go to the coast, get on the boats, and go home. Because they get the shit kicked out of them that hard by people who are accustomed to using light and heavy cavalry in coordination. Those guys also have sabers. Now, the sabers weren't the dominant part of the victory. It was having more tactical tools than your opponents know how to deal with. That was a big part of the Mongol success as well. So, in the 13th century, you start to see lots and lots of falchions because the people in West Central and Western Europe are going, we've started to see in the Middle East and in Europe lots of highly effective single-edged swords that are not just little things like a sax, but are long weapons which can be used by knights on cavalry to high effect. 14th century Italy, we see the same thing going on. Now I have to apologize, I've got an anachronistic picture here in this slide for a reason. That's this one over to the left. This is a fresco from the 15th century. St. Ladislaus and the Kuman. It's a Hungarian Carpathian Basin tradition. Shows very clear gear that would be taken for granted in both contexts. And the Kuman's what? gear, Steppe Guy's mm -hmm. gear, is more or less consistent across both 14th and 15th century. The equipment tends to be very conservative and to change very little. And these guys were also used in Italy alongside Hungarian soldiers. They also wind up in Bohemia in the early 15th century during the Hussite Wars. Lately, we've even have a video game showing some of those guys off. So now people know that Cumans exist. In the meantime, we have the Neapolitan Succession War and the Hundred Years War in Italy. We have lots and lots of combination heavy equipped and light equipped horsemen with bows running around, many of whom also have sabers, that are reaching into southern Italy where they don't see a lot of sabers. Northern Italy, Venice, along the Adriatic, they already see lots of it. Hungarians and Venetians in this period actually equip up very similarly. If you look at the Kepesh Chronica and you look at 
Is it Giro the Courtois? Oh, I have to yeah. look it up. I think it's Giro the Courtois, which is a Neapolitan manuscript. You'll see that their gear is very, very similar. And that's because there's this zone, just like there used to be a zone from the Byzantines up to the Carpathian Basin and through the Kievan Rus, now that zone is Venice, Balkans, the Adriatic, Hungary, Bulgaria, while it exists or is trying to exist again in its long fight with the Byzantines, Byzantium, and to a certain extent, the incoming Ottomans. And that means that as you move into the 15th century, you start to see Italian gear that is notably different than, I'm going to use the same word, Westernish gear. If you look at the bottom, those are labeled as falchions in Zagreb where they're stuck on the wall. What are the characteristics of these weapons? You can look at the, some of those and go, hmm, those are definitely falchions. And you can look at others and go, oh, that's starting to look pretty darn saber-like. What, for instance, in falchion number two, distinguishes it from the so-called saber of Charlemagne? We have a canted hilt, we have a mild homogeneous curve, we have a long extended yelman. Well, we do have these fancy little extra bars to protect the hand, and we do have a Hungarian or Adriatic style cat's head pommel here. So there's a little bit of difference. This is a long knife. Clearly, this is a longest messer. It's even got a nagel. That's not a cutlass. That's a messer. You can see where this starts to get complicated, right? I gave a description in one of the other chats about the history of the Neapolitan Succession Wars, so we're not going to spend extra time on why this guy is probably a Hungarian. It's somewhere in there in the channel. I typed for like an hour. There's plenty of history there. You can go check it out. Somewhere in there will be a link. Fifteenth century comes along. We have a lot of tasak. We have a lot of messer. We get really complicated stuff going on here. Because hilt design and hilt furniture absolutely makes a difference. But at the same time, functionally, how much difference is it making? How many Kriegsmesser do we see with giant yeomen? And who decided to put them there? It's got the nagel. It's got every feature of a messer you expect, except the clip point. Bohemians tended to prefer a clip point. Bohemia was one of the major centers of arms and armor manufacture in Central Europe. One can make an argument that the beginning of the Taborite Wars, Bohemia is actually one of the main centers of arms and arms production in Europe. The new city of Prague had a lot of weapons and armor manufacture going on. So before we get more modern, any questions here? Uh, we can also yeah, deal with vociferous objections. Ascent, go for it. Uh, speaking about um, like modern, etc. Um, the last picture and this also shows the knuckle bows the first time in your lecture. Mm -hmm. So, I'm just not getting at all why the knuckle bow was not adopted earlier. I just don't get it. It's a simple piece, it's not in a way, etc. It protects your hands so well, I'm just not getting why it wasn't earlier. There are a couple different theories for why it becomes more popular. But one of them is simply that it adds weight near the hand that folks may not have wanted there. If you look at most Bongus Messer, you'll see they don't have the knuckle bow there. We also have lots and lots of people who in earlier eras would have been pressed into service fighting with spears, or if you're in the Carolingian Empire, cudgels, literally cudgels, because they just don't have enough swords for all those people, who are now able to get this kind of ironmongery. And if you're fighting on foot at close quarters, a knuckle bow is really, really handy for punching people in the face. Now, I know we don't have manuals where they say, let's punch people in the face, but this is also a question that comes up for basket hilts. 
why not enclose the whole hand in a basket hilt? It makes sense, right? But unless I have missed something somewhere deep in Lonergan or the British sources, I don't know of a single source that says block with your basket. Somebody may correct me on that later, but it's a terrible idea. If you punch your basket at a blow, you're likely to lose your wrist as they redirect the blow. In. A knuckle bow adds extra security to the hand a little bit, but in my opinion, it's probably there for close quarters brawling as much as it is for actually protecting the hand, especially because many of these guys would have lightweight protective gear they would already have on their hands. It's all supposition at this point, and your opinion on that is every bit as good as mine. But at the end of the day, I'm tracking this down to economics gives you options, and we don't like talking about economics in the middle of our history, but Europe economically after the Black Death goes through radical transformations and it's really hard to compare eras where you have lots of disposable people to eras where every last peasant is valuable so we even stop consciously destroying their peasants when our nobles feud and find other ways of solving our problems because we don't have enough peasants to work our fields. So the unromantic answer is it could be any of that and it probably comes down to something shockingly dull and economic. Good? Um, you say economic in terms of uh, how much iron they or steel they could afford or what do you mean because like there were kings shown with sabers not having knuckleball? I mean economic in terms of you have to have a number of sabers made in a given way for it to be a factor. Hmm. You need Let's think of this in biological terms, although it's not a good metaphor. You need to have a number of human beings in order to have a beneficial mutation pop up, right? Mm. Same thing with sabers. You have to be making a certain number of them before somebody goes, yeah, I did this thing. And yeah. this thing decided to catch on. Why are there little knobs on the end of some cross guards and on some of the earlier sabers? It could be fashion. It could be that it served some purpose in helping to secure it on a scabbard so that it didn't tend to wobble. You have all kinds of experimental archaeology that can go into why this way or why that way. But when you're making these things by the thousands, it's a very different affair than when your noble orders one and your local weaponsmith cranks one out. And it could easily be something as prosaic as somebody got their kin bent really hard. Someone else saw that guy and thought, that guy's a badass. I want my kins made like his kins. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. It's, it's yeah. weird still, though. I just don't get it. It's totally weird. It's really easy with hindsight to say, well, shit, why didn't they just use lathes? Lathes for everything. We should mass manufacture everything. But we don't see industrial use of lathes in the way we're accustomed to thinking about it with jigs and interchanging parts until the late 18th century. Lots of things are obvious with hindsight that aren't otherwise. So one of these three sabers in the middle is a Hungarian saber, and the other two are Turkish. The Ottomans come roaring into the vacuum left by Byzantium after they're done smashing the Byzantines in just punishment for their many, many really, really stupid good ideas, like refusing to pay the al Mugabar or refusing to pay the Alanian mercenaries, either of which groups would have been powerful enough to keep the Ottomans a tiny, almost tributary state threat. Oops. So you have lots and lots of Ottoman troops ranging across the Mediterranean and in continental Europe ranging through the Balkans and into East Central Europe as opposed to Southeast Europe. And many of them were troops who came from the Balkans themselves. And a lot of their gear was very similar to East Central European gear as used by Croatians and as used by Neapolitans, excuse me, Venetians, not Neapolitans, Venetians, and as used by Hungarians to the point where outsiders frequently couldn't tell the difference between who was who. And so you see, for example, this very standard 15th century Hungarian saber form 
Adriatic style Eskians, popular in Hungary, Venice, the Western Balkans, big yelman, cat's head pommel, a mildly canted handle, a uniform curve, a pronounced yelman, seeing a pattern here, starts to get exposed to different fashions. And now we have a return to the Turkic cross on the very conservative Ottoman blades, which then, again, explodes into different topologies later. And we start to see people talk about, gee, sabers, they're totally a thing. But in the meantime, as that's spreading around and people are getting exposed to sabers, for example, Spaniards saying, how do you fight these guys? Marcelli going, you should be aware of these. Well, there were people in Venice who had lots and lots of boats and were familiar with them anyway, but that doesn't mean it penetrated up to fencing circles. We still have to go back and consider two of the element elephants in the room were sabers and saber-like weapons. Now, there is a little bit of my personal druthers here. We don't have the text for Durer's work with the Messer which is a crying shame because as a body mechanics specialist, it's what I do for a living, who also fences and who worked on Le Kuchner, I see real differences between Durer's use of the Messer and Le Kuchner's use of the Messer. And some of those differences, in my mind, make the Messer work a little bit closer to saber type actions. It's it would be a long and definitely hemo wild lecture to put out there, and I could trace that down. But you can look at some of the weapons and go, hmm, some of those are straighter. Some of those look a lot more saber-like. We have a yeoman. Nope, we have clip points. Why? Because they expected clip points. And why? Because the ethnic Germans living inside Hungary, because the old kingdom of Hungary was a multi-ethnic state, and you had lots and lots of Saxons and Swabians living there, like clip points better than they like raised yeoman. But if I were to say, oh look, a scimitar, and show that longest messer from the top center picture to any fantasy gamer, they would go, oh yes, a scimitar, it has these stats. The same problem occurs with Dusex. You have Paulus Hector Meyer with his stirrup-hilted sabers being practiced up top. You have power and fight below where not a stirrup-hilt. He's got the little extra hand protection. You got Meyer in the lower left. The training tool made from wood. The medieval equivalent of his synthetic buffer has got the stirrup-hilt. And you have Dusak that go all over Europe. They become shockingly popular everywhere. Big ones are usable from horseback. Little ones are great for brawling in towns. Are they sabers? Look at the top right. If I took that picture out and didn't say it was a dusak, you could very easily be forgiven for saying, yep, that is obviously a saber. Or you could be forgiven for saying, nope, that is totally a falchion. Side note, the term is a Germanification. You have several weapons terms that come into common usage in German that get transliterated across the alphabet. So you have, for example, the Zischage helmet is a specialization of the term Shishak, which in Hungarian means helmet. In other words, the general type of lobster-tailed helmet in general use in Hungary and Poland and among the Osmanli troops gets described as the specific model of car, or in, case, in this case, helmet, and the specific term. Dusak, in my opinion, is the same way. You have a saber that winds up getting specific forms of furniture on it, and it winds up being called a very specific thing in the German language sources. And in my opinion, we make the distinction here based on linguistic artifacts. If we all spoke a Slavic language, this would be a lecture about Dusak or Tasak, or Chesak maybe even. And Saber and Dusak would be the side note weapons. But functionally, if you look at this, 
especially this middle one, this is very clearly a rehilted blade. This is not what many of the sources are saying. Yes, totally a Dusak, as seen in Paulus Hector Meyer. Why? Because we have lots and lots and lots of examples of rehilted blades. And you update the hilts based on current fashion and current ideas, and you slam new furniture on them. It happens all the time. And it is a huge problem for anybody who wants to take a topology and make it according to whatever your present find in a museum is without knowing the provenance of a weapon and how many times it passed through different hands and how many times it got rehilted along the way. David Edge was snarking at me when I toured with him through the Wallace, but he was not kidding. Almost none of those weapons in those racks are actually the original furniture on the original blades. And we have to deal with that problem when we go, oh, jeez. The Turkale, that one in the weapons history we know exactly about. Keelich blades from the Balkans, from Transylvania, got stuck into, oh look, I like the Keelich blades, I'm bringing them home and I'm putting the furniture I know on them. Not a Dusak, it's a Turkale. Ask any Scotsman. There is no functional relevance to the weapon I'm mouncing over with my cursor and a Dusak. And if you said so, you clearly have not been working in Palace Hector Meyer. Yes, I'm being a little bit sarcastic here, just for the purpose. One of the ways this happens is because the Ottoman Wars takes a lot of manpower. You have lots and lots and lots of people coming down from the Holy Roman Empire fighting. You have lots and lots and lots of the poor, the desperate, or the ambitious coming to fight. Because if you survive, you can retire as a gentleman very easily very good chance you wind up in some company that's used as forlorn hope and you don't survive but in the early modern era hunger is widespread life is nasty brutish and short and these things pop up in odd places such as the dude on bottom who is the john smith that most american historians talk about insofar as the founding of jamestown he was knighted by the dude on top for dueling ottomans in transylvania History goes to weird places. The guy on top, Bathory, Old Transylvania, fought the Ottomans all over, and also just happened to be somewhat important in Polish history. And the saber gets introduced to Poland in a widespread basis via Bathory, and the Poles begin to make a gazillion different variations of it. From there, the saber comes into really, really wide usage. And it comes into really, really wide usage in Northeast Europe. Now, as I referred, the Prussians also loved the Hussar. But based on the history of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, Northeastern Europe, they already knew plenty about sabers and used sabers all the time. France was a different affair. After the failed Rakoczy uprising, lots and lots and lots of Hungarian manpower went to Russia, lots of them went to Turkey, and some of them went to France, including this fellow, Laszlo Bercini, who had served underneath the guy who was number two to Rakoczy before they all got hacked. And the French went in on Hussars in a major, major way. Hussar fashion became fashionable. The fashion of what looks good changes, literally the advent of the Hussars, changes French fashion history. And they start using the saber a lot in their light cavalry. Their heavy cavalry tends to stay with swords at this point. And many, many of these guys tend to bury into German-speaking families, and they and their children form the Hussar regiments that the French will use throughout the 18th century. The French Revolution comes along, and it's part of the reason why the Napoleonic era is the cutoff for this discussion, and a lot of these guys run like hell. Where do they run? They run to Russia, they run to Turkey, they go back to Hungary. If they hang around, they don't hang around very long, or they tend to lose seven inches off the tops of their shoulders. So this results in a fractured history of saber use. 
you have early saber use, and then you have post-revolution contrapoint, where the import model of the saber winds up going away in terms of native French swordplay at this point is very point-centric. They keep the point-centric fencing. They go back to point-centric fencing on horseback. The Hungarians and and by Hungarians, I'm using this term very lightly, include many Croats, include many Saxons, include anybody who would have been serving in those Austrian regiments. We're using their own gear according to their own training, sometimes according to their own units, which emigrated in groups and got picked up, for example, inside the Ottoman Empire by Bergeny when he went on giant recruiting drives for the French. Because the French realized, hey, light cavalry is really frickin' handy. And then it goes away and we get this sort of back and forth for how should sabers be used. And Le Marchand famously presents this, which must be a saber. It's the only saber worth talking about if you're many, many Brits. He gets exposed to what's going on with the French and some other continental powers like the Prussians during the War of the Austrian Succession, at which point he realizes that British cavalry tactics leave, shall we say, much to be desired. British horsemanship, well, the Brits are famous for many things and are really, really good at many things. They are not primarily known as a horsemanship people. So Le Marchand famously changes that and adopts the Austrian fencing of the time and manages to convince them to use a saber based on an Austrian model for the light cavalry, but not the heavy cavalry. By that point, you then have diffusion all over the place. I have left off Iberia because it is complicated and I'm not competent to discuss it. The short answer is they know all about sabers because they're fighting them with the Turks for a long time, and the historiography there is complicated, but they're familiar with them and using them well before the Brits start adopting them wholesale, but I can't get into it in rigorous terms. So, we now have the saber, or saber-like swords, or palashes, or saber furniture with straight stabbing blades all over Europe, and what would you like to call a saber? Who's got questions? Um, on saber and uh, Tusak, um, um, Tusak. Mm -hmm. um, so would you consider the saber or not? I consider the Dusak to be a German word or a form of saber popular across the Adriatic which has many elements common to Venetian, Hungarian and Balkan sabers and specifically keeps the hand protection which was common on Adriatic weapons. That's a mouth what about that Messer? Exists. Messer is more complicated because there are several different types of Messer. We have the Bauernwehr West Messer, which is very clearly a knife. We have Messer, which are, functionally speaking, very clearly sabers. So, in the Messer, it depends on the functional vocabulary. Mm. If I describe the weapon and it has most of the characteristics of what I would consider a saber, it's got the curved edge, there's a single edge, clip point, or let's say take the Latin phrase accidentia. If most of the accidentia says saber, I consider it a saber. If most of the accidentia says this is just a larger knife, then I consider it a larger knife. And there are several topologies out there for Messer which distinguish very cleanly and let you see very cleanly, that's a knife, that's something that we're calling a messer, and it's got a nagel on it, but it's a little bit different. I mean, yeah. look at that Krieg's messer up top now. There's no way you look at that and go, yeah, Krieg's messer, they just took a long knife and suddenly turned it into this giant two-handed saber thing. Hmm. Elephant in the room, the Swiss saber, much the same way, and in much the same period. And what about pommels now? Um you said in the beginning uh, about the description that they lack a pommel, but now in the middle you sometimes say, except when I have a pommel. And you know, you showed, for example, the pictures of um, the Tessak with a pommel. Mm -hmm. And so, 
It's, well, that's there, the there are, there are there are Here's an example, top right. Now, many Western Europeans are not familiar with this weapon form, but this is the mid to, mid to late 15th century Hungarian saber in classic form. Many people who look at sabers say sabers don't have pommels, which is why I included the phrase. Very clearly, that can't be correct. But many people will say it's got a saber grip, no pommel. It can't be a saber. That's clearly some kind of sword. Hence, going all the way back to the beginning of let's simplify and try to define a saber. I mean, if you don't have a cross piece or you don't have a shell, how can it be a saber? Well, ask anybody who's, ask anybody who's equipped with a shashka. If you're issued a shashka, that's, that's clearly a saber, right? Or is it a longest messer? Because the word literally means long knife. Would you consider um, Japanese swords a saber, uh, like Tashi, I, Katana, or Wakasashi? I do consider the curved Japanese swords types types of sabers, yes. Because I'm going sabers to... Two-handed sabers, basically, right? Or optional. We know Avar sabers and some others, such as the Kriegsmesser, have, yeah. have handles that could work with one or two blades, two hands. And we have Tachi and Katana, which can be wielded easily in one or two hands. So you bastard sword is sort of a is sort of a pseudo historical term, but the bastard four can easily be wielded in one or two hands as a functional term that I think deserves deserves a little bit more respect than it gets. And I put those sabers and Korean ones that are very similar in that same camp. What about back sword and spadoon? So. Look at the functional characteristics of a spadroon. It is a straight, a straight blade that's aligned right? with the hand. It's designed to allow some cutting and some thrusting, though generally privi privileging the thrusting. Hmm. So I classify that as a sword because it functions similar to the way you use a sword. Similarly, I consider a palash a sword, a back sword which does not have a curve and there are some people who will label back swords with curves, back swords, not sabers. A back sword that has no curve, I would consider a kind of sword. Or more specifically, a kind of polish if it has the saber furniture on it. Is there a way when um, a, str a saber that is straight, what makes it then? When it's clearly everything about it is a saber except for it being straight, how do you call it then? I, I keep with the East Central European custom, and I call that a palash, or a palosh if I'm in Hungary. Okay. Thanks a lot. So if now, you're accustomed hopefully to, other accustomed to also that, have questions. Yeah, absolutely. If you're accustomed to the East Central European definitions of things, you look at it and go, palosh, and you move on immediately. And you see descriptions of them in the weapons text all over the place. For example, those who play with Thane and his different weapons. He distinguishes the saber from the polish, and if you get into later fencing, you'll see different tactics based on the fact that one's got the curve and the other one's got the reach, and so you fence a little bit differently while you're in your canted hip stance, because the target's available change a bit. Um, oh Next yeah. question. Oh, so one last question of me, which is, so in the in the early centuries, like early medieval centuries, we've seen a ton of sabers. But mm -hmm. then we seen a lot of straight swords, you know, the normal depiction of uh, knights with one-handed straight swords. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, shortly longsword and so on. But then it gone back to saber. Was it because of the armor, you would say, that at the beginning, less armor, having curved blades is nice, and a lot of armor, maybe not that useful, and then having, again, less armor? So it becomes that, is the, again, that is the academic commonplace that runs with it, and it is an accident of forgetting about the Cuban Rus. The unromantic truth that explodes that is that for most of the early and high and late Middle Ages, Eastern Europe was more, not less, heavily armored than Western Europe. The Western Crusaders encountered rigid armors regularly and rejected them until around the early to mid-14th century.
the first third of the 14th century, Western Europeans and S Western Central Europeans start going in big on rigid armors. They had seen them in a number of cases in a number of different places, didn't adopt them. Arabs had access to rigid armors. The Turks had access to rigid armors, various forms of Joshan or early forms of what we might call coats of plates, lamellar, heavy use of scale, brigandine. But those armors, while rigid, lacked articulation, and they left gaps. Whereas male, you could beat somebody down through if you just hit them hard enough, but there were no gaps whatsoever. If you're armored kappa P, they mean it. Literally everything from your head to your foot is covered in metal. And if you've got padding underneath it, it's really hard to hurt somebody who's armored up like that. Whereas if you've got somebody who's got rigid armor, but they don't have male standards or something through their armpits, you can gank them in their armpits or hit them in the back of the knee with a thrust and expect to succeed there in a way that's not happening if they're wearing male shows. If you're wearing but male shows and go for that shot, all you why we are sabers, Why were sabers not even more popular in the Middle Ages you know, when we have a lot of pictures with straight swords? In my opinion, it comes down to the horsemanship. The saber rewards horsemanship. The saber takes advantage of fast, mobile horses that most of Western Europe doesn't have until quite late in our timelines game. And in East Central Europe, you see Kievan Rus, Hungary, Balkans, Byzantium. You do not see any animus against nobles equipping more lightly. You have princes in the Kievan Rus and the Hungarian kingdom, for example, using archery on the battlefield, and no one thinks twice about it. So you may be equipping out with much heavier gear. You may be equipping out with straight swords. You may be equipping out with curved swords. It's a giant jumbled mismatch. And you have to go into some very specific drill down kind of stuff to get the context for why they're making the choices. And there was also a topos for a while that Hungarians and others used sabers, forgot about the sabers, and relearned about them when the Ottomans showed up. That was a theory that happened because medieval studies itself was in its intimacy and they didn't have the breadth of finds and art historical data to work from. It turns out that's incorrect. Sabers have been in constant use in the region from the 9th century to the 20th. As opposed to that Johnny-come-lately flash-in-the-pan upstart, the longsword that everybody adores. Okay, somebody else? How how do you how do you expect us to be able to live our lives now now that you have shattered the the paradigm we used to? How how do you live with this cursed knowledge to know that there is no such or everything we've been told about sabers is a lie? I expect you to meme. Is this a saber? Anytime anybody throws a curved sword in front of you. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask about um, contemporary accounts and or what we can either infer know or might believe about what like some either fencing masters or other historical figures like in general might have thought about the issue because i think it's um about what when you look about no about like what we can infer or know about what like people contemporary to these swords might have thought so to give a specific example <clears throat> um yeah, okay, so actually if we look back at the Dusak uh, with both Parnfeind and Meyer, mm -hmm. uh, so Parnfeind very explicitly states this is like the fencing with the Dusak, but it is also the fencing you do with the Messer. And that's mm -hmm. like what it says in the manual. And, and, and Meyer will, uh, he sort of jumbles and he, he says it's the fencing with the Dusak, but then he will randomly call it Messer uh, a few times, like during the mm -hmm. manuscript. So the weapons like that they show are arguably different. Uh, yes. Like they they're, they're, they they can be classified maybe the same if you want to, but they're arguably different weapons. Where because like when I see, uh, yeah, when I see like Parnfeind Dusak, I'm like, oh, that's a Messer, and then when I see Meyer Dusak, I'm like, oh, that's a Dusak or a saber. Uh, so I'm wondering like, <sighs> yeah, like w how are you is it, is it like that? Which, it, yeah, so is it like as we think that maybe these people never cared whatsoever, or or is it more like 
Or is it more that, like, just in this specific scenario, like, Poundfin's ID of a Messer or a Dusak was closer to an actual knife type or sword type blade, and, and, and Meyer's ID of a Dusak or a Messer was closer to, like, a curved type uh, blade, something like that? And it, Or it doesn't have to be specifically with these two guys, if you know any other examples. No, there's ac they're, actually, they're actually beautiful examples of that. And I think mm. that the answer is yes, that both of the things you said are true. For example, right. we commonly see sabers referred to in Latin manuscripts as swords. Mm. And the people who are sending the messages back and forth do not give a single poo that they have not dis distinguished between Honda or Volkswagen when they're talking about their cars. Mm. Because it's not the point. There's a big your thing going on, the reason that they wrote the letter on expensive parchment in the first place. And in the case of Power and Fight, I think it's very clear. He pretty much says so. He does distinguish the Messer from the Dusak, and he does have a sense of the Messer that is more sword-like, is more straight-bladed, is used a little bit differently. And that makes perfect sense if Power and Fight is thinking of the Messer as in a context that is different from how a Venetian is thinking of a coltellaccio. Yes, the word technically means the same thing. It's a long knife. But the long knife that's the coltellaccio is very clearly something different from the Bauernwehr, right? Mm. So I think that you have to drill down into individual context in order to suss those out. And that one of the problems we get with this and the reason why I go to a functional vocabulary rather than a straight typology is once we denature all of these people out of their context and just say this is this is this is this is this it becomes very generic and very abstract and very divorced from the weapons many weapons we do not call sabers based on what museums have said for many years have every single characteristic of what we would consider be described as anything else but sabers and sabers in that form dating from the ninth century hmm yeah all right thank you all right i know i've run you guys a little bit long any other questions i so have got another 25 minutes or so so i've got the most time. important question of all obviously is side sword versus saber what would win <laughs> Side sword versus saber. Well, I think there's not as much difference between Bolognese fencing and Hungarian fencing as people tend to think there are, although the vocabulary is all over the map. I think the obvious question is, who's done their footwork? So the answer is rapier. <laughs> I know, I know, but that's why I asked side sword, because it's a bit fairer. Yeah. I will say that as a saberist, I am only afraid of two weapons. And that it, the first is a spear in the hands of somebody who is a spear specialist, and the second is a rapier in anyone's hands. <laughs> because there are lots of historical matchups, and if we have an open parking lot to play in, that matchup favors the rapier over the saber. But the saber, 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 the saber, saber sucks. <laughs> and saber what? Or matchup on the saber end, I can say that. I couldn't hear you. Say again? If you're if you got a saber against a rapier, it's a it's a bad time generally. Yeah, the rapier's play and the rapier's fencing has the weapon has both developed and evolved to deal with people who fight with sabers on foot. But side and sword, they're very good at it. side so sword. A bit more similar, it's slightly longer but still cutty and so on, right? So, I'm going to defer you to the people who will then argue with you back and forth about what distinguishes a rapier from a side sword. And if you have learned anything from the lecture I have given you, you know <laughs> I'm not going to bite on that. Because, again, if I throw an abstract topology out there and denature the actual weapons and the actual choice of usage, it no worky. I think you gave an, a great answer. If it loses against a, a saber, it's a side sword, and if it wins, it's a rapier, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's a good one. one. Yeah, so there are contexts. No. Ah, the meme has begun. Yes, thank you. 
Yeah, there are contexts in which a rapier is hot garbage, which makes no sense to use. And for that, you pull, if that if you absolutely need to have a straight blade when you're running around on your light horseback and and you have lots of armored guys you can't stab because they still have breastplates, get a polish. Um, which can I be distinguished from the rapier by dot, 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 I'm not going there, because rapier versus polish in terms of functional topology is different. Okay, go ahead. I, you were saying? I heard an interesting story about uh, the British and French doing studies on what's more effective um, on the battlefield in certain situations, which is they found out supposedly at the cavalry charge the straight blades of the French were, were more effective, while on foot the um, sabers were a bit more effective of the British. Um, at, like, at that time, the nations did studies on that. I'm not sure what was their exact conclusion, just like that rough part I remembered. Well, the Eastern, Cent the East Central European solution to that is have both. So you have hussars who have concerts or hedgeshter or really, really long pointy palosh if you want to get you know, really pedantic about it. And on the charge, they run people through with those, and as soon as they get to close quarters fighting in melee, they haul out sabers. And if the saber breaks, they haul out their saddle axe. If the saddle axe breaks, they pull out their polish. So would you say um, straight swords are um, a bit more better at um, thrusting an opponent at your height, or maybe a bit lower, but sabers are better when you, you might not be as fast and like hewing downwards? In one-on-one -on -one combat, the advantage of a dedicated thrusting straight blade is that it's long and pointy. A curved weapon is nothing but a long weapon squeezed into a short space. I know that sounds ridiculous, but think about the geometry. What does the curve yeah. do? It takes a long weapon and makes it shorter and creates arcs. It can do things that straight blades can't, but it does suffer for reach. So if you play a very careful distance game, and it's one-on-one -on -one combat where having your arm out there to thrust at somebody won't simply get it lopped off in passing, by your target's neighbor, then without question, they have to overcome that breach deficit. It's the same thing that makes spears dangerous. Would you say sabers cut significantly better than straight swords, or just a bit? I think that's... Um, in On the saddle, I think sabers cut better than straight swords. On foot, I think that topos is total bullshit. Okay, um, interesting. There are early medieval cutting blades that look like they're total dedicated cutters. They have, excuse me, thrusters. They have somewhat wide at the shoulder and very pointy at the end. And what they're really doing when you make impact eight inches from the tip is having an almost weightless, tiny, pointy curve out there serving as extra edge to go through the target while still leaving it very, very handy. I have straight swords that are every bit as good cutters and terrifying cutters as the cuttiest saber I've got. But if you want to swat somebody with a very tip-heavy weapon because you want momentum to penetrate while you're on horseback, then you want a curved saber because now yeah. you can actually get more oomph because the, the horse is providing extra force. If I swing it, it gets to maximum velocity. That's the end of the day. Whatever tip speed I can provide, whatever momentum I can provide with my body, that's it. Once I have the horse's momentum to play with, then the heavier cavalry saber starts to shine in a way that it doesn't on foot. End of story. Stab people with straight blades, cross train with sabers, because that's what the people who knew both weapons did. They did lots of thrust training, and they thought that was super macho and fun, and they did lots of cut training, and they thought that was super macho and fun, too. Any other questions? All right, well, I have taken us to almost 90 minutes here. So if there's no other questions, what I'm going to do is refill my water and take a restroom break and then go to the lecture reactions and start checking out what questions have been asked there. Good? Sounds good to me. Thank you. Thank you. We've got more videos and content coming, so if you liked what you saw and it was useful for you, please stab the like button, slash subscribe, and punch the little bell icon so that you're notified immediately when new content comes available. Thanks, and go do the thing.